friends, it's a bright early morning in Gurgaon and I'm very honored to have been able to get this meeting with Mr. Tim McCartney Snape. He's a true representative of what the human mind and body are capable of. World renowned and respected, Tim McCartney Snape, the seven feet tall, first Australian to have summited Mount Everest on 3rd October 84 from North Face without bottled oxygen and without the help of high altitude porters, thus creating history. In 1990, McCartney Snape returned to climb Mount Everest for a second time with the idea of climbing the Everest from sea to summit. The expedition took three months, starting off from the Bay of Bengal. Tim is a patron of the Outdoor Council of Australia. He's an author of three books and co-founder of Sea to Summit. He was awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia in 1987 for service to mountaineering. In 93, he was rec recognized with a member of the Order of Australia for service to mountaineering and international relations. There have been several films made about Tim's exploits, including an award-winning documentary. I feel super honored to have got such illustrious guests this season, and I welcome Tim to Life Begins at 40. So you're yeah. ahead of us. Yeah. yeah. So let's start. Tim, I am super stoked and honored that you agreed to come all the way from Australia on Life Begins at 40. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So um, I have seen your movies, I have read about you, and I've visited your website that lists an entire basket of offering for mountaineers. While normal human beings would dream of scaling perhaps one or two peaks, you seem to be out to conquer, conquer the world. Why is that so? Well, there are actually many people who've done a lot more than I have, but um, look, I've always wanted to get on top of things in the landscape, whether it be trees, hills or mountains. And um, for me, one thing led to another, you know, climb small hills, on bigger hills and eventually ended up in the biggest hills and the biggest hill of all. Yeah, it was really just a progression. And how, how uh, old were you when you started doing this? Look, I was, um, ever since I could walk, I climbed things. So, you know, I was always falling out of trees because, you know, branches break. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until I was um, at university in our national capital, Canberra, the ANU, where I got the first opportunity to actually do some technical climbing, that is rock climbing. And I was already a mountain hiker and a bit of a backcountry skier, but it was at university that I got my first chance to do roped climbing. And then during the holidays, I managed to save enough money to go to New Zealand, which, um, for those of you who don't know, Australia is the flattest continent on Earth. Yes. We have no real mountains. There's no permanent snow, although we have some good snow in the winter down in the southeast. Um, we don't have any mountaineering as such. Mm. And New Zealand's the closest place. So in my first two or three summers at university, I would save enough money to go across the Tasman Sea to New Zealand. And, and there I learned the, um, the art and science of mountaineering. And uh, then I got on a university club mountaineering expedition, which was planning to go somewhere in the Himalaya. Eventually, we settled on a peak in what is now Uttaranchal in the Gawa, yeah. uh, near the famous peak of Nanda Devi. But um, this was a peak called Dunagiri on the outside ring of the Nanda Devi sanctuary. And uh, it was a tremendous experience. Uh, well, going to India in the first place, a place like Australia, very different. And then uh, heading up into the foothills of the Himalaya with, you know, the, into the headwaters of Ganga and eventually up um, past uh, Badranath and 
up into the Rishi Ganga, which was uh, awe inspiring and difficult uh, terrain, uh, really um, incredibly steep and and treacherous if you're not careful. But eventually we got to our base camp and I think the first thing was really just a sense of shock at being in altitude. You know, we haven't, most of us hadn't experienced being at altitude before. So that was a big psychological blow. But, um, you know, we managed to overcome that somewhat and continued. And in the end, I was the first, well, I was the only Australian to end up climbing a 7,000 metre peak. And um, I just kept going back after that. How wonderful. A prolific climber, rock and ice both. And... How, how are the two types of climb different and how do you prepare for each one? Well, good question. I, I, you know, for me, um, whether you're climbing a tree or a rock face or a mountain, yes. it, it's, about, um, it's about looking at um, the objective and thinking, oh, well, that'd be fun. To, that, that's a good challenge to try and get up that. Hmm. And then... You ask yourself, well, in the case of climbing a tree, you just try and do it and you may not always be successful. But in the case of a mountain, it's, you're looking at, um, or a cliff face, you're looking at a possible, it's a form of exploration. So you're looking at something and you can see the overall picture, but, but you cannot see uh, the detail. You can never see the detail. And... It's with that sense of excitement that you approach um, your, your um, chosen objective. And, and, and you only choose the objective because you, well, for me anyway, I only choose an objective because I'm, I look at a mountain and think, wow, that's a, that's a beautiful, first of all, it's got to be a good looking peak. And even if it's not a good looking peak, the, um, the possible way up it, the challenging way up it has to be appealing. It has to be a line, it has to be a logical um, path from the bottom to the top and it can often be a, you know a prominent feature like a spur or a buttress of rock and ice or even an icy face that looks safe to climb and so 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 primarily it's the inspiration to climb something something aesthetically pleasing and then um, whether it's rock or a rock face or a big mountain wow. uh, you've then got to ask yourself well mm, do I have the necessary ability uh, and knowledge to do it? And uh, in some cases, you might think no, but um, I'd like to try and get those um, abilities. And so you set about uh, going along a path of climbing some, some lesser objectives mm. where you can learn. Right. And that's really what I did. It was, it was a step-by-step -step process. So I didn't just go on a Himalayan expedition with no experience. Although some might argue I had little experience, <laughs> but you know I had climbed um, some uh, good, what mountaineers would call good routes in New Zealand, challenging routes, and uh, challenging enough to give me confidence to tackle, hopefully a seven thousand metre peak. Although of course the I had no idea about uh, the effects of altitude, um, but anyway I, I did have some technical experience, and um, I always. I suppose you could say I was a fast learner um, because I had natural affinity with, with that, um, with doing those kinds of things. Right. And so I didn't have to do much beforehand in order to get the necessary experience to um, push to the next level. Hmm. Uh, but I think it's always very important, whether whatever task you take on in life, to be realistic about the challenges ahead and... Um, maybe uh, pull back your optimism a little bit to be realistic so that you can, you know, when you come to uh, tackle your, your difficult dream objective, uh, you, you can do so with a little bit more, not just confidence, but um, experience under your belt. And having experience under your belt is really, uh, it's not really apparent until things go wrong. And, and it's when things go wrong that uh, the value of experience starts to cut in. And things always go wrong on the climb. I, I mentioned it's got kind of a, it's a, an exploratory process 
climbing, whether it's a rock face or a mountain, you you can see the whole thing. You can see the big picture, but you can't see the detail. You never see all the detail. Even on a rock face, it's not very high. And it's only when you get on onto the climb that the detail reveals itself. And uh, usually it's always more difficult than you expect. And there are always things, there's always the unexpected. And that, I suppose, is the same with any difficult project. But that's what makes a project difficult. There, there are obstacles in the way which are unforeseen. And um, it's the way you tackle them uh, which can, you know, make the difference between being able to proceed or not. And so, you know, having that experience on experience under the belt really does um, give you a more solid foundation to, um, you know, push push forward through any difficulties. And so, uh, has technology helped in any way or aided? Uh, look, technology is always um, has always been useful to human beings when they go into exploration. Right. You know, from um, even when we're you know when we're hunter gatherers, we we use technology to enable us to um, push further over into uncharted territory, whether they be simple hunting tools or you know knowledge is also technology, of course, um, and so. The knowledge of, of navigation, knowing where the sun and the stars are. Um, but um, in terms of mountaineering, of course, yes, because mountaineering takes part, place in a harsh environment and, you know, in, in, in on difficult stretches on a mountain or on a rock face, to safeguard yourself, you need um, technical equipment to, uh, to arrest a fall, for instance. Yes, and... Um, so technology has always you know, been critically important, but the, the biggest uh, advances in technology for my kind of pursuits, the outdoors, climbing and so on, has been the, have been the advantages in, in weight, in, in the actual weight of what you need. To, oh. Because it, you have to be self-sufficient, which means you have to carry everything on your back, in your backpack. And, um, you know, since I've been in the outdoors for, well, the, the at least 50 years, the equipment has changed a lot. And the main difference in that equipment has been the weight. And the level of comfort has gotten greater because you can, as, as um, materials and so on get lighter, you're able to take more with you. Uh, and um, because it's lighter, you're able to, you know, do more difficult tasks. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, technology... One of the sad things, I think, it's sad in a way, in the, is that, um, you know, the satellite photography, mapping, has really taken a lot of the guesswork out of um, above land-based exploration. We still can't see a lot under the sea, so there's a lot of exploration done there, but... Um, so these days, you know, I've not been able to resist going to Google Earth, for instance, and looking at um, the aerial images of places I'd like to explore and seeing, because still, there's still some places where it's very hard to get good maps of, um, you know, in places like, I mean, I think all of the world's pretty well mapped, but getting access to that map in some places is quite hard. India, for instance, which I understand the border, the northern areas, in the Himalaya are sensitive because of the, um, you know, the border uh, um, conflict with 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 the big power to the north. Yeah. <laughs> so no more. Um, uh, you know, I, I think um, the Indians have been always a bit sensitive about releasing uh, good mapping right. to to the, to the general public. But um, yeah, so that's one of the slight downsides of uh, these days is that. Um, Exploration is kind of, you know, you, you always know what's beyond the horizon now because of satellites. Interesting. So wait, what has been the easiest climb for you and the most difficult? I think the easiest climb, so to say generally, it's hard to be specific, but generally the easiest climbs have been the ones where everything's gone to plan. 
and there've been no surprises. And I, I suppose in the simpler picks, there, there's a lot of them, yeah. but they're the un, they're not really the memorable ones. The memorable ones are, are difficult ones, such as when our friends and I climbed the South Spur of Annapurna II in mm. the central Nepal. Mm. Uh, that was it was constantly giving us a tremendous feeling of adventure because the climb actually started really down low in the gorge of the Mardi Kola at about two and a half thousand meters, temperate rainforest. And from there, we had to start climbing up these uh, muddy uh, plant choke cliffs. And eventually we got up to just place just below the snow line, big adventure just getting there. And then um, there was a series of obstacles that continued all the way to the distant summit. Um, treacherous terrain, uh, a lot of avalanche danger, and so much uncertainty right until we set foot on the summit, uh, including two nights out, out in the open you know, in a very cramped uh, couple of ledges barely big enough to sit on. Um, so that, that, that was a very memorable, very difficult experience for us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to, to just pick, um, cherry pick just the easiest and the hardest, but um, and the, the easiest, I mean, you know, some people are on a quest to climb the seven summits, the so-called seven summits. Mm. American uh, billionaire Dick Bass, was, you know, made a lot of money because of Texan. His family made a lot of money in the oil business. He uh, said, he was also a keen skier and set himself the task, a bit of a climber, set himself the task of climbing the highest peak in, in, in each of the seven continents and then thus became the first person to do that. Of course, the Australian um, highest, Australia's highest peak is Mount Kosciuszko, which is uh, barely above 2,000 metres and you, you can actually walk up it very, very easily. So um, I guess you could say that was an easy peak, although um, I was there last week doing a photo shoot with the North Face Equipment Company. And, uh, you know, we're doing some trail running um, shoots. And whilst we were sort of mucking around with that, I was actually just on the west face of Kosciuszko, which is boulder strewn. There's a few little cliffs there. And, uh, and I thought, well, yeah, this is, um, this, is, this is kind of, everyone says Kosciuszko is a, just a mound, a boring mound, but actually got some rock climbing on it. <laughs> You make it sound so easy. I go for treks and I am struggling to climb up those little hills that we have in North India. I want to understand when I'm climbing those hills, there's fear plays a major role. So where does fear feature in all of what you do? And what have, what have all these years of climbing taught you? Fear is a critical part of any decent adventure, right. for sure. Because, um, well, you, know, you, could, you could have a, a sort of a, a general statement that um, if you're not experiencing some element of fear, then uh, what you're doing really isn't that memorable or worthwhile in terms of being exploratory especially in climbing. And so, you know, it, it's, um, fear is a, a good thing to have in the equation. Uh, but of course, uh, a lot of fear is to do with ignorance. Ah. So um, one, one has, um, you know, knowledge and, and that's the process of exploration is actually acquiring knowledge. It, um, one um, goes through uh, the spectrum of, of being fearful to being knowledgeable and, and, and respectful. And so respect replaces fear. Uh, but fear still underpins that respect because uh, fear drives you to um, use all the techniques you've learnt over experience. Over, the, uh, over time to safeguard yourself and, and your team. Um, 
if there was no fear, then it'd be so much easier to be complacent about uh, dangerous situations. And, uh, and that's when even experienced people can come unstuck. But complacency is uh, a, a constant um, threat to, um, you know, the safe conduct of, a, of an expedition. In fact, I would say, you know, it's very healthy to be fearful of complacency because obviously, you know, you, when you become more used to doing something, you become complacent and therefore less fearful and therefore um, there, there can be a tendency, tendency to be less on guard. Understood. What I hear from you is that fear is good. It's essential for our growth. However, respect and being prepared are two crucial elements for any adventure that we need uh, we, under, uh, we undertake. Is that correct? So uh, yes, for sure. You're also an inspirational speaker, Tim, and you speak on a variety of topics. Would you like to share with us what you talk on? Well, um, you know, when you become um, the first person in your country to climb a big peak, especially if it's the world's biggest peak like Everest, yeah. inev inevitably, um, you get, inevitably you will get asked to speak at conferences, for instance. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's quite common for um, high achievers, including sports people, people who win medals and so on and so forth, to yeah. become, you know, keynote speakers for, for, for a brief period and so on. Um, so yes, I've done. I do a fair, a bit of public speaking, but I think why um, what I talk about resonates with people is that, that the climbing a mountain is perhaps the clearest symbol that we have of of achievement. Of so getting to the top of the peak is is one of the clearest symbols of human achievement, and um, and so. Um, you know, symbolism, symbolism is, is a very important psychological aspect of, of the human mind. It's very important. Our subconscious, the language of our subconscious is symbolism. It's not words, which is part of our intellect, our conscious thinking self. Symbolism is part of the subconscious. So... Um, if you try to inspire people, it's, um, it's more long lasting to inspire them at a deeper level than merely a superficial intellectual level. So um, there are plenty of speakers around who can who call themselves motivational and they can G up an audience and um, reel off a whole heap of platitudes about uh, um, winning and um, you know, um, you know, the path, paths to success, et cetera, et cetera. But um, being inspired rather than motivated are two very different things. Um, being motivated, is, is, I think, is something which comes from, uh, it's more deeply rooted. It's more deeply rooted desire to, uh, to, to shine, to, um, to achieve something greater than the mundane average. And a mountain is a beautiful and, and very powerful symbol of doing that. And um, really the, the secret to being successful in any, uh, in any task that you might set yourself, any goal that you might set yourself, uh, is very, it's obviously very important to have a goal. If you don't have a goal, it's really, um, you know, you don't know where you're going. So it's important for the goal to be clear. The mountaintop is a very clear, clear goal. Um, but uh, to get to that goal, it's really important to be um, inspired by the path there, by the challenge ahead. And um, not so much by the prize of getting to the top. Because, of course, there's nothing at the top of the mountain. Um, you know, if you were successful in a business project, for instance, yeah. the prize might be 
a multi-million dollar contract. But um, in the case of a mountain, it's simply, well, it's simply the, the joy of getting to the summit. And, and um, I guess there's a lot of self-affirmation that comes with that and ego satisfaction. But um, if you just uh, go for the goal of, if you approach a mountain by just wanting to get to the summit because you can talk about it at the next cocktail party or whatever, mm. then um, you'll find that that's a very, it's a, it's a poor motivation for it and a difficult one because you need to be inspired you need to be, and therefore motivated by the process of doing it, the challenge of doing it. And you need to engage yourself in actual, the actual um, path to getting there. And, and all the difficulties and challenges that that path presents. And so, um, yeah, so th that's why I try and impart in an audience when I give an inspirational talk, it's, it's to get them to understand that uh, the path is often very difficult, but it's never far from being satisfying. And, um, and, and in many ways, uh, enjoyable, but there will be times when you want, you want to give up and you've just got to be uh, aware of the fact that you've just, take, you've just taken one step at a time. And if you just keep doing one step at a time, just concentrating on the, on the next step immediately ahead of you, then uh, it's amazing where you can take yourself. Um, too often we get overwhelmed by the enormity of a task ahead and that enormity can overwhelm us to a point where we give up. Um, and, you know, what we should be doing at that point is basically um, taking our focus away from the bigger picture, the summit, and bringing it back down to the next step. You've got to focus on that next step. And just do that for the time being. Yeah. And when you get to that next step, then you re reassess, and then you look at the next step, and then you do that. And... Uh, and by doing that, and always, of course, when you're taking the next step, deciding which way that step will go, you are, you are looking a certain way ahead and thinking, well, um, yeah, better if I do this, that will ensure that the step ahead of that um, will then be easier and more successful or more whatever. And so uh, always, of course, in the back of your mind is, is the summit, the, the end goal, um, but it should never be the, um, the overriding um, occupier of your um, of all your energy. The next step should always be. So beautifully differentiated and articulated. So beautiful. So there are 14 peaks over 8,000 meters of them. Which ones have you scaled? And why have you... I did not read about you having scaled K2 or the Savage Mountain. So uh, have you ever attempted or thought of scaling it too? Um, I've actually always been a little bit um, wary, one of a better word, of going for the um, for numbers, uh, you know, the 8,000ers. Um, the, the seven summits, um, I've actually preferred going to out of the way places that are less traveled. And with the exception of Everest, it's the highest mountain. So it has a, occupies a, a place unique to itself. Um, certainly K2 is very attractive, but because it's very attractive, it's had many attempts and um, including one by me. Uh, but um, when we attempted that peak in 1987, uh, we would say it's fair to say we were a group of hardcore alpinists who uh, we'd set ourselves a goal of, of climbing the peak alpine style, but not just playing lip service to, to, the, to the concept of alpine style, but, but actually uh, seriously doing an alpine style. And that means... Uh, you, you don't set foot on the, on the mountain until you, um, you are setting out for the summit. So you don't go halfway up the mountain, get a climb ties, come back down again, 
and, and you know, maybe fix a few ropes in the, in the, in the process. This is, a, this is going to be a pure alpine style ascent, which has never been done on a big peak before like that. Um, you know, setting off, setting off from the base with no prior knowledge, going all the way to the top, hopefully, and then coming back down again. But even back in 1987, there were very few possible routes to do on K2 that offered that opportunity. Nevertheless, we thought we'd found one. And so we headed off. We got sponsored by Hollywood because they were making, they wanted to get some background footage for some blockbuster movie. <coughs> and um, so we, we you know, got good sponsorship. Um, however, when we got to the base of the mountain and then had a good look at uh, our proposed route, which was going up the east face, we quite quickly came to the conclusion that it was too foolhardy. Too dangerous. Uh, it was obvious that uh, there was no safe route up the east face. Um, often you will find faces on mountains that have, you know, where you can dodge most of the objective dangers. But on the east face of K2, um, turns out there was a very good reason no one had ever attempted it before. It was exceptionally dangerous. There was massive avalanche potential right across. Um, the entire place and we decided that that was not feasible anyway we thought well we'll just pull back our ambition and maybe do an alpine style ascent of one of the other routes apart from the normal route and so that's what we set our eyes on in order to do that we wanted to get well acclimatized so we started climbing uh, other peaks surrounding K2 but every time we got to around about 6,200 metres, 6,500, you know, around about that altitude, we struck uh, severe avalanche danger. Wow. And this happened on three occasions. Oh. And after the third occasion, I started to have doubts about that particular season. I thought that conditions that year were, were not good. And in fact, there was another expedition on the normal route of K2. And they were reporting similar conditions between around Camp 3, above Camp 3. So, um, you know, it wasn't looking good. And I decided to call it quits. The others stayed on, but um, to no avail. In fact, one of the, the person on the other expedition died because of the conditions. So... It was a good call not to proceed on that, not that occasion. And then uh, a few years later, I got an opportunity to go back to K2 up um, the seldom ascended North Ridge. Mm. And the, my friends were going on, I was invited along, but um, I was too um, preoccupied recouping money from my Cedar Summit expedition, which occurred earlier in that year. I was, had, had a lecture tour, I had a book to write, and um, I sort of yeah, regrettably in retrospect gave up the opportunity and they ended up climbing the North Ridge which was you know, a great climb but um, you know uh, it was um, had it been a first ascent I would have been a lot more regretful but um, anyway um, that's the way the thing goes it's always nice to have some peaks that are, you haven't climbed and also I think uh, sometimes wisdom and intuition play a stronger role Injured, as compared to being adventurous. So for me, while I've been listening to you, I, for me, you epitomize uh, Captain Kirk of Star Trek as he explored and went where no man has gone before in space. You're going where no man has gone before on Earth. And tell so us about the us. world transformation movement. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, so um, I've always I've always been interested in uh, biology. Human, uh, I studied biology at university, yeah. and oh, especially you know I think every human should be interested in our story, the story of of, of uh, human beings. It, it it turns out that it is it is the most most remarkable story in the whole universe, at least as far as we know. Because 
certainly uh, within this part of the universe, we are the only fully conscious being to come into existence. And by fully conscious, I mean that the rest of the animal kingdom, remarkable as it is, is separate from humanity, even though we are a primate. Yeah. Um, it's quite clear that we had primate ancestors. But how come in all of the magnificent diversity of life on Earth, right. how come, this is the great question of bio, in biology, how come one species, this really quite rare ape, probably in the Rift Valley of Africa, mm. was able to get transformed into a species that came to dominate the world because it somehow became fully conscious. It developed a conscious brain, a brain different to all other animals. And that is, um, well, some people would say it should never occur. It's caused all the problems. Well, that has caused a problem, but the, 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 the great story is that um, these problems, you know, human nature, the human condition, mm. are, are all come about as a byproduct of this incredible achievement of becoming fully conscious. And so emphatically, uh, comprehensively explained on the website www.humancondition.com. Com, which is basically uh, the culmination, if you like, of my friend Jeremy Griffith's work in unraveling the biological reasons for why humans became fully conscious and the problems we were saddled with becoming fully conscious, uh, resulting in the human condition and the, and the, and the psychosis, which... Uh, accompanied that and the great realization that we can actually there is a transformational pathway where it's predicted by all the great religions whatever you know whether it's christianity hinduism uh, buddhism uh, islam they're all fulfilled by this explanation because we need to understand that religions were a pre-scientific way of trying to explain the great conundrum in human life. Is, are we good or are we bad? Mm. Are we an evil species or are we a divine species? Because um, there's been that paradox right throughout human history where we've had this kind of guilt hanging over us. We're born knowing that we're good, yeah. but... Looking around us, we can see all sorts of evil happening. Um, and, and also, we, all, we see all sorts of um, uh, expressions of love and selflessness, as well as that selfishness and greed. And that incredible paradox that is human nature is finally explained and understood. And this, the outcome is we are good. And we can transform that. We can leave, we can put all that aside simply by understanding that all of that, all of the troubles that we've had and we have within us, the darkness and so on, mm. we can learn to love the dark side of ourselves and see that it was just part of the process, the necessary part, part of the process of um, getting to where we are. But, you know, it's our time because um, as time moves on, uh, the burden of our psychosis just becomes more and more unbearable. And it's plain in the world to see now, uh, you know, the, 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 the fractious nature of human affairs now is, is, um, is so evident yeah. everywhere. Yes, well, let's hope so. You know, um, without hope, the, we have nothing left. So um, hope has sustained us and, you know, religions for all that people criticise them for have, have been the main vehicle in human history 
for sustaining that hope. But sooner or later, uh, we had to have uh, a rational rather than mystical explanation for explaining that we are good, explaining that actually yeah. humans are a divine species, divine in the sense of, um, you know, with having this incredible brain, which is able to appreciate beauty and create great beauty and experience love, right. um, but ultimately to understand that um, the real meaning of life is love. Understand from a rational point of view, not from a theoretical, uh, moralistic, um, um, theoretical point of view. It, it's, it's actually understanding from fun, biologically fundamental truths that love is, is the purpose of life in the universe. That's what everything is striving for. And, and uh, to understand that there have been many roadblocks in the way of that, uh, they're just simply uh, impediments, which difficult mountains, which had to be overcome, had to be climbed over, and um, uh, so we could get to the, you know, the, the more verdant, fertile valley on the other side, which is um, post the human condition. So I urge, you know, all your listeners to look at www.humancondition.com. And, and persevere because it's, it's, it's not an easy journey because uh, the brain has been really programmed to avoid this most difficult of subjects uh, because we've had no answer until now. Mm. And so, you know, people are rightly wary of any uh, subject that gets close to the bone in that regard. But um, uh, just be patient and... Um, um, allow your, yourself to, to walk through uh, the process because it, um, it really, I'm, I'm convinced that that is all that will save the human race, is that, uh, that fundamental understanding. Tim McCartney Snape, five years hence. <laughs> uh, it has to be out in the natural world where things are unspoiled and everything's in harmony and that's free of the angst of, of uh, the human condition, uh, which is a future we can look forward to. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm always happy when I'm out in nature, but um, yeah. you know, whenever I get back to civilization, it's kind of a shock and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm part of that too, I guess. So, um, but I'm, I'm, I've learned that um, there is a path through that and, and hopefully, you know, the whole uh, of humanity can, can negotiate that path and only until then will it be, you know, will our journey be fulfilled really. Hmm. So after all that deep talk, I, uh, we will move on to a round which is quick fire and quick responses. And to start with, what are the five most important things for Tim? I've always had difficulty in, in, in narrowing things down to um, <clears throat> a, a narrow list, but I suppose, you know, um, <laughs> just from a, from a biologist point of view, um, you have to start with, um, you know, fresh air because you need, <laughs> you need oxygen right. to breathe and fresh air. Yeah. And then, um, then it's a toss-up between um, water and sleep, actually. So I've always been um, – I'm a great tea drinker, so I love India for that reason. You can get tea anywhere in India. <laughs> um, but um, – and, and you know, everyone who loves tea knows that water is very important. So obviously having clean water right. and, and then um, sleep. Sleep's really important because without sleep – your brain cannot function, even even animals um, to, to the lowest order need rest. So the nervous system uh, needs, needs rest to reorganize itself all the time. And if you don't have that sleep, um, you know, if you even, even deny yourself of the regular eight hours, which is, you know, I'd recommend, 
well, at least seven, um, then you start um, stressing your body in ways which may not be apparent for years and years. But yeah, sleep's very important. And then after that, of course, then um, food. But um, I've gone through, what, four? I think overarching all of that is love. It's compassion, love, uh, lack of um, self. Because it's always the, mo always the most fulfilling things you can do is what are those you can do that benefit others, um, whether there be plants and animals or, or most importantly, human beings. Lovely. So when you're not crawling, climbing up towards the skies, what is it that you're doing? Well, I've, I've, um, in order to pay the bills, I've always had some sort of interest in business activities. For um, I've always been a, a part-time guide, guiding people in the mountains because I, I just enjoy introducing uh, the mountains to um, other people. Uh, whether it's mountains or, you know, wilderness. Okay. Um, there's only one thing I'm really good at, and that is finding my way around um, wild country. I, I, I notice in other people that when I compare myself to other people, that is, that is some, a gift I have. I can, I can find my way through it pretty well. I can always find the best way. And um, so I love introducing other people to wild places. Um, that's you know, something I do on a part-time basis. For a long time, I was involved in the outdoor industry as a um, designer and manufacturer of equipment. Um, I sold up my interest in that business a few years ago. It was called Cedar Summit after my Cedar Summit expedition. And um, now I've, I have another um, interest in, it's really a startup. In oh, it's not. It's not. It's a. It's a tech business where um, we have an app that um, will help people plan and um, you know execute um, outdoor activities. With depending any any sort of travel or in, in the outdoors, it's called uh, Where'd You Go? Mm. W e j u g o Where'd You Go? Mm. And um, then my work with the World Transformation Movement. Um, where we are promoting the ideas, my friend Jeremy Griffith um, has explained in that website, humanvision.com. That's uh, pretty, f and then of course, I still love going climbing and skiing and all that stuff. And uh, do, do you believe that you are lucky? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone who's alive and, and um, well, I think anyone who's alive and not in dire circumstances is lucky. Um, it is, you know, by pure luck that any of us are here. I do think, though, that one makes one's own luck to a certain extent. Mm. But I also think that with good luck and good fortune comes responsibility. So, um, you know, uh, even though I've done well in life, I'm not about to, uh, you know, go and live a higher life in the Bahamas and Monte Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I could afford to anyway, but, um, you know, I think um, I'm always motivated by, um, you know, trying to make the world a better place. Lovely. A book that inspires you. I think, well, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of books that inspire me. Um, I was always inspired by the works of... Um, Lauren van der Post, and then I met Jeremy Griffith, and his books inspire me. Um, you know, freedom, uh, the end of the human condition, is really it would have to be the most inspiring book any human could ever grab hold of. Yeah. Why are your movies not on YouTube? Uh, they are. I think they are. A few. Or, a couple. Yes, years. but, you know, the ones that have got uh, where the rights have expired, they're, they're on. But um, I suppose the other ones, when the rights are not expired, then, um, you know, it's, it's difficult. You probably find a way around it, but I haven't bothered yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
what is the most satisfying thing? The most satisfying thing mm. is waking up in the morning and knowing that you've got a, a great day ahead and that you are alive and healthy. I think the least satisfying thing is being unwell. I think, um, you know, that is, uh, it's an awful state to be in and, and it's not, uh, unfortunately, we don't, we don't realise uh, how good being healthy is until we get sick. Yes. <laughs> so we take life for granted. <laughs> it takes one to appreciate the other. Does anything make you unhappy? Unfairness and uh, pers personal aggrandizement at the expense of others also makes me unhappy. Your values? I think one... One becomes successful, one should always uh, share one's success as much as possible. Your favourite drink and your favourite food? Water. Yes. Has to be, um, you never appreciate the, um, the wonder of, of fresh, clean, cool water. And till you're without it for a while. And that then becomes the most glorious thing you could ever have. But it's closely followed by a cup of tea. <laughs> and then perhaps a beer. <laughs> and then um, food. Uh, as a Nepali porter once said to me, um, if you've worked really hard all day, any simple food tastes good. <laughs> so... You know, rice and dal is the most wonderful thing you could have if you're hungry. Right. Um, you know, you can take all your fancy foot dishes. Um, I, I, well, no, I'm actually a fussy eater. You wouldn't think so well, what, after what I've just said, but I am a fussy eater. I like things to taste good and, and I don't like, um, you know, all the the tricks that food processors use to um, make you think you, what you're eating is, uh, tastes good, like adding lots of sugar and salt to things, um, yeah. food, you know, flavour enhances and so on. But, so nothing beats um, good, fresh, simple food. What do you want to be remembered as? Uh, an enthusiastic boy, I think. Okay, so um, is there anything you feel that you can't live without? Well, I think it, the same goes for every human being. That's love. It's very difficult for any human to live without love. People can do it, but it's a very sad existence. Hmm. I mean, love in the all-encompassing sense, the fact that um, um, one feels um, not just wanted, but um, part of the larger whole, that, that, you, that, you, you, that others, other things embrace you as part of um, their world. Yeah. So your go-to place with yourself when you want some me time? My imagination. Interesting. It certainly has been different. <laughs> the prior two years to that were, um, I guess I was um, doing a lot of walking, running and climbing. Walking, running, climbing, and skiing. Uh, this year, well, I've been doing similar actually, but it's been restricted to my own home state of New South Wales because we've um, been not allowed to travel, which um, is something I find a little bit hard to um, uh, agree with. I think um, that uh, you know our, our liberties have been unreasonably restrained because uh, in relation to the threat that um, 
this virus has posed. And, uh, you know, I think um, it's tragic that um, the vulnerable and the old have been uh, so affected, so badly decimated by, by the virus. Um, but it's also tragic that the lives of young and healthy people have been so impinged upon by, in, in varying degrees, by various governments. Um, you know, I think when we look back on this current mm. phase, um, I think history won't look kindly on the way it was managed. I think um, that's very easy to say, you know, talk about in, in hindsight, but um, not quite in hindsight yet. Um, we're not out of it yet because even though there's, you know, various vaccines developed, well, um, of course, like any other virus, it mutates and um, so there's going to, it's going to be with us forever. Right. Um, but I just hope that we, anyway, so, you know, what I just hope we can change our, most governments can change their attitude towards, um, you know, one of, well, in the case of Australia, they've really been, they've gone from an attitude of sort of flattening the curve to eliminating the, the threat, which obviously, if we want to restrict ourselves from the rest of the world, then, you know, we'll have to keep doing that because if, if we want to, you know, that's what we'll have to do um, to, to eliminate it. But it's not something that can be eliminated. Um, but um, <clears throat> what I've been, so I can't see myself doing anything different um, to what I've done the past three years, which is, um, you know, maintain an income stream through my various activities, um, keep uh, you know, offering to promote the world transformation movement through humancondition.com, um, continue to um, introduce others to the wonders of uh, you know, going, going outside and uh, having outdoor adventures and perhaps a bit more writing. I quite enjoy writing, but it means sitting down on the desk and not going outside. <laughs> right. Three books to your credit already. So Yeah, well, you know. I, I would, you know, I remember um, a famous climber once said, um, never write anything, son, you'll only regret it. <laughs> But um, um, yeah, I've written a little bit, but um, looking, reading back on them, I think, oh, I wish I'd said that differently or that differently and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I guess uh, one gets wiser with age. But um, yeah, I would like to write a little bit more. Wonderful. Three attributes that make Tim McCartney Snape the person that he is. Optimism, stubbornness. Yep. And well, I'd like to think a sense of fair play. Definitely. Definitely. It has been a pleasure meeting you. An absolute delight. And I'm really honored. I'm touched that you have so kindly agreed to come on my channel. Well, I thank you for reaching out to me, Sanjana, and uh, all the best with um, your ongoing activity. I, um, you know, I, I, I wish you every success in that.